In the last video, we talked about how much power the sun has and what the intensity of the sun is as you spread out and get farther and farther away from it. Here on Earth, we receive a certain proportion of the sun's overall power, and that intensity is averaged out over the Earth's surface because sometimes the Earth is day, sometimes the Earth is night. In this video, we're going to talk about what happens once it gets to Earth because not all of it gets absorbed. Some of it gets reflected back, and there's certain properties and definitions and calculations that we can make to help us define how much of the sun's power and intensity gets absorbed and how much gets reflected. So in this video, we're going to start by talking about these two terms. One of them you've actually seen already. In our last lesson, we talked about this emissivity value. And in particular, we talked about it in terms of something that is absorbing energy. Emissivity is the power that is radiated by a surface divided by the power radiated from a black body. Now, it feels kind of weird to think of it as radiation, but also think of it as absorbing. It turns out to be kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, so in this video, we're going to refer to emissivity based on how much something would absorb. Um, albedo is the opposite of emissivity. Albedo is the power that is scattered by a body divided by the incident power. So if I wanted to calculate and define this in a simpler way, we can say that the albedo is essentially the percent of light or percent of power that is reflected, and emissivity is the percent that is absorbed. So albedo and emissivity, kind of two sides of the same thing. Now, because of that, we can actually add these together, and they should always give us 100% or 1. If we were to see this as an example, we say that incident uh, we have 80 watts of power, uh, and let's say that 60 watts of that are reflected. Very, very simple numbers to, to do an illustration here. To calculate the albedo, we're basically just going to take 60 divided by 80, the amount that is reflected divided by the amount that was incident in the first place. Now, that'd be about 75% reflected. We're going to uh, present albedo, just like we did with emissivity, as a decimal form of that percentage. So every number is going to be between 0 and 1. We'll define this particular albedo as 0.75. From that, what would you expect the emissivity would be if emissivity is just the opposite of albedo? So if they have to add up to 1, and emissivity is a percent that's absorbed, it's just going to be whatever is left over. So in this case, the 20 that was absorbed, that wasn't reflected, uh, gets divided by the total of 80 to give you 0.25. Same thing, it's 25% absorption. Now, the Earth, from that 340 watts per square meter, about a little over 100 of that gets reflected back. So go ahead, uh, and with this, I would like you to calculate what is the albedo of Earth, taking the, or the uh, intensity that's reflected divided by that average intensity that is received. We can calculate the albedo is about 0.3. Um, that means about 30% of the, the light that is uh, shining down on Earth gets reflected. Now, that gets reflected from a variety of different places, um, which we'll talk about. So what on Earth, sounds weird saying that, uh, is going to be reflecting this power? Here is a table of a variety of different um, surfaces. So from mixed farming tall grass all the way down to desert or snow or ocean. I'd like you to look at this table. You see some differences between summer and winter. And I'd like you to figure out, okay, which of these is the highest albedo? Um, highest albedo, in this case, means it is uh, the, the surface that reflects the most sunlight. So the highest number is the most reflective. Looking at these numbers, um, there are two that are pretty close. Snow and sea ice are both pretty reflective, but snow is the highest albedo. Um, our lowest albedo is the one that absorbs the most energy. Um, so from this list, which of these is the most absorbing? So the lowest albedo. Looking down here, there is one that is lower than the others, and that is the ocean. Um, so the ocean is very, very dark versus snow, which of course is very, very light. You have probably seen this situation if you have like white or black paper. Um, the main difference between these two is that the black absorbs more sunlight and the white reflects it. 
Now, these different surfaces on Earth is what gives us that overall average of about 0.3. Um, and again, this changes uh, as uh, seasons change because snow is very reflective. So in the winter, the albedo is higher in those given areas. If you look at an overall map of the Earth that is charted by its albedo, you can see kind of what this breakdown looks like. Uh, in this picture, the red is the highest albedo, the highest reflectivity shown here is like 0.4. Um, and you'll notice there's a couple of common things here. You see really high albedo um, when you go north, so kind of in the tundra area, so uh, northern Canada and then Russia. Uh, the reason for this is that is high levels of snowfall. Um, so a lot of these are covered by snow and ice. And you'll see here in Africa, there's a pretty high albedo. Why would you think that there's a high albedo here in Africa? This is testing your geography a little bit, but something that is really important uh, to know about in this area of Africa is the Sahara Desert. So one of the reasons for the high albedo here is because desert is also um, something with a pretty high albedo, maybe not as high as snow and ice, uh, but that reflectivity of the sand um, is making that a pretty high level as well. You'll see uh, news stories as we get into our conversation on climate change of ways that we can engineer our planet. Uh, and a lot of these ways are pretty controversial and we'll get into some of them. Um, but one uh, that I think is kind of cool is there are places like LA that have uh, tested out different ways of adjusting albedo. So by painting uh, these roads that are typically black and absorb a lot of energy, uh, painting them white, uh, they're able to actually measurably change the temperature of these cities uh, because there are less surfaces that absorb. And typically cities are known to be hotter than areas of country uh, or more rural areas because most man-made things have a pretty low albedo. If you think of it, roads and parking lots are all generally pretty dark and, and asphalt absorbs a lot of energy and that absorption turns into heat, making our cities pretty hot. So ultimately where this is going to be leading us to is what we're trying to find is some sort of balance. In order to maintain a constant global temperature, you can't be receiving more energy than you're emitting. Um, one way that we were emitting energy there was just reflecting it back. We're going to talk about some other ways as well. But if we have an average intensity of 340 watts for every square meter that's coming into our planet, for our planet to not noticeably change its temperature up or down, we have to find a perfect equilibrium where the amount of energy leaving the planet is also 340 watts per square meter on average. Uh, and this is really important. Even like one watt per square meter out of balance one way or another can noticeably over time really, really change the climate of our planet. And that's one of the things that we're seeing. And that's one of the ways that we're going to be describing climate change in our next lesson in terms of physics. And with that, a really important factor is going to be the greenhouse effect. And I'm sure you have all heard of the greenhouse effect uh, at some point in your lives. Um, if there was no atmosphere, we would be way out of balance. Now, the greenhouse effect actually has a lot of good things to it. Uh, if our planet didn't have this greenhouse effect where our atmosphere is preventing some of this heat from leaving, we would... Uh, have a lot of challenges in our average temperature. Uh, once we reach this equilibrium, it would be about 30 degrees colder than it currently is. That's a ton. Uh, when we talk about climate change next lesson, uh, a change of like one or two degrees is a really, really significant change to our way of life. So 30 degrees um, makes our planet essentially inhabitable. Um, so we'll get into the details of how the greenhouse effect works a little bit more next lesson. But for now, I wanna look at this atmosphere and kind of uh, front load some of this so that we can review it later on. Uh, if I were to track the different gases that are in our, our atmosphere based on how much they absorb uh, in different wavelengths. So we got UV, visible, and then here, very importantly, in the infrared, which is where a lot of the, the thermal transfer takes place. 
you can see a difference, and it might be hard to read these, a difference in the amount of these different uh, greenhouse gases and their appropriate effect to the atmosphere. So here, water vapor is in this blue. Water vapor is actually our number one greenhouse gas. Uh, that is the one that has the largest effect on this greenhouse effect causing our planet uh, to maintain a lot of its heat. Um, number two here is probably what you would expect if I said greenhouse effect it would be the first one that you give me, and that is carbon dioxide. That's seen here in the orange. Um, and then the third one is probably another one that you have heard of. Uh, it is commonly referred to as one of the more potent greenhouse gases. It's not quite as plentiful in our atmosphere, and it uh, dissipates over time. Uh, so it's not quite as high as water vapor and carbon dioxide. But number three here shown in purple is methane. So these are the top three. I expect you to know at least these top three. But our last two are nitrogen oxides and then oxygen or ozone. Um, and all of these have a very important property that their resonant frequency happens to be about the same as the infrared light that is trying to leave our planet in the form of heat. Um, like I said, next lesson we'll refer to the, the science behind this greenhouse effect, um, how we can actually describe that and what that means. But for now, know that these are our main five uh, greenhouse gases when we talk about this effect and uh, its role on our planet's equal equilibrium in the balance of our energy.